Hey everyone, my name is Perry, I'm an electrical engineer, and in this video we're going to be watching clips from Big Bang Theory Season 5 to see how accurate all the science technology in this TV show really are. Uh, try! <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I'll try it. <laughs> Wait, like this? Almost. Really get your tongue in there to activate the motion sensor. No, no, no. I, I really hope that there aren't engineers actually devoting their time to inventing that. I don't want to know how that works. It doesn't really seem sanitary, and I doubt there's a market for it. Unless there's a whole other field where OnlyFans innovations might be a billion dollar industry, I'm not sure. But long distance relationships are becoming more and more common. Although I don't think this is actually going to hit the market anytime soon. No! You mean this was all a ruse? Oh, how could I be so stupid? That is actually very easy to build, just having two open conductors really, really close to each other, and when someone shakes your hand, the circuit is formed, shocking the other person. But that could inadvertently shock you too, because if there's two open wires really close to each other and you make contact with each other, you're actually likely to get shocked in the process. You're probably not gonna latch on like that unless you really juice up the power and he would be in a lot of pain. Would not be able to stand up like that afterwards. The the electricity running through you that would actually cause you just to like clench something and spaz up is a pretty decent amount because then you lose all of your muscle control. That that that's never fun. Come on, tumor. Come on, tumor. Mama needs an aggressive little glioblastoma. <laughs> Yay, brain tumor! <laughs> Probably not the same reaction you had when you got the news. Anybody who has a friend who's a doctor or in med school or any medical field like that, they are that sick. It's not like in an evil twisted way, it's just a lot of surgeons don't have the opportunity to do certain neurosurgeries because they need somebody to be dying. And that's not always something you want to look forward to. But as somebody who wants to get better at surgery or research, something like that, you're kind of hoping for something like this to come across your way, which is a little messed up, but it is for science. The actress who plays Amy in this show has a PhD in neurology, so she really knows what she's doing here. This is not acting so much as it's just like revisiting grad school. But this scene's also really accurate for how brains are stored and used in research because a brain just sitting on a table will actually liquefy at room temperature, which is really weird to think about because there's no other organ in the body that does that. Your bird death ray is ready. It's not a death ray. It's just a little ultrasonic blast to scare him off. Two, one. <laughs> that is one tough birdie. <laughs> That is a great example for acoustic resonance. Natural frequency is a frequency at which a system or object oscillates on its own. Force frequency is purposefully sending sound waves in a particular direction to bring about a new result. If the force frequency is equal to the natural frequency, the vibrations increase a lot in amplitude, and this is called resonance. The most common example is someone changing the pitch of their voice to shatter a wine glass. The wine glass has a natural frequency which the person is trying to match with their voice and the instant it connects, the glass shatters. For objects that are made up of multiple materials, this is much harder to do because when you reach the resonant frequency of a window, for example, the glass is vibrating and interfering with the adhesive and the window frame so it doesn't shatter as easily. And when it does, it still maintains most of its structural integrity because the vibrations are transferred all around the object instead of holding them in one place. <laughs> I thought you said candles were dangerous. This is a Bunsen burner. <laughs> I'm a scientist. I know what I'm doing. Oh. Took me a gallon of urine to make that water. Okay, I don't want to know that last part, but I have not seen a Bunsen burner in forever. Like, we used to use these in middle school and high school for science experiments, which, I, looking back at it, I think they trusted us way too much. 
Bunsen burners will produce one flame from a constant supply of gas, and you can adjust it to control how concentrated the fire and temperature is depending on what experiment you're running. They're very commonly used in university labs for all sorts of reasons, but generally speaking, if you're going to run something on a much larger scale, a Bunsen burner is too concentrated of a fire to actually be effective. Got to experience zero gravity. Cool, how do they do that? Well, it's pretty neat. You get in this plane that goes almost straight up for like 20 seconds and then straight back down like it's gonna crash and they do it over and over again you know, no matter how many times you throw up you threw up yeah this really is a part of the nasa astronaut training and the plane that howard is talking about is nicknamed the vomit comet because almost everybody throws up the first time that they're on it your body is not used to zero gravity, so your brain has a really hard time equalizing, which leads to the vomit. Roller coasters work in a similar way, where you ascend really high for a very short amount of time, and then you dive very low very quickly. But you're strapped in. In the Vomit Comet, you unbuckle yourself for a few seconds to experience zero gravity, then a timer tells you when the plane's gonna level off, so you strap yourself back in to not get seriously injured. And it, it's certainly true, they do this over and over and over again because it's the best way that we know of to simulate zero gravity because when you're in the International Space Station, there's no break. You are floating the whole time you're up there. It's not up and down. You're just up and that's how you just keep on going. I slept in a hole I dug in the ground with my bare hands. And at some point during the night, an armadillo crawled in and spooned me. <laughs> NASA does require survival training, but I don't think they do it like that. This is, and, and if they do, then it's not something I'm aware of, but as far as I can tell you, the, you do have to be in a really, really good physical fitness to actually be up there, because while the astronauts are in space, they are actively working out on a treadmill and they do lift weights, because your body will lose a lot of muscle mass while you're up there, and you don't want that. It's going to be pretty detrimental for your health, and they do run a lot of simulations underwater, for example, and they train you very, very well on Earth to the best of their ability. You can't simulate space all too perfectly because he's going to have to redo a lot of these physical fitness aspects, but you can't be in that vomit comet with a treadmill. That makes sense. There's quite a few things that you just learn when you get up there, and there's no real way of preparing someone for it. Just try it. What's it supposed to? Oh my god, this is so <laughs> uh. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. <laughs> okay. Me, 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 me. <laughs> Leonard, I am your father. <laughs> The gas that he's using is sulfur hexafluoride, which is six times more dense than air. And right now, even as I'm talking, and just in general, what we're exhaling is carbon dioxide. So that's what our voices generally sound like when we're just talking in um, everyday terms. They're not really inhaling that gas for the sake of the TV show, because the effects would last much longer than that. And for you to get the gas out of your lungs, the easiest way would be to sit upside down on a couch and literally let gravity push it out. The reason you have to do that is because that air is much, much heavier than the air all around you. So it would just sit at the bottom of your lungs. You can't push it all out. You have to literally be upside down to let it all leak out of you. Helium is what makes your voice really, really high pitched. And the reason your voice goes back to normal is because helium is lighter than the air around you, which means it's naturally gonna escape your lungs as long as you keep exhaling or talking. 